we talked about we want tough questions. A question that you never was able to ask a police officer because why? You either answer a call, write a ticket, or taking somebody to jail, right? So you never really have that in a relationship with the officer. I said, don't don't worry about the question or, or your answers because there's not gonna be any ramifications from it. And that's what keeps us really pushing forward and trying to reach out to uh, individuals because if we can change somebody's life coming out of prison the chances of them to be a recidivism rate will go down and a crime rate will go down because they're not out there committing crime and so, so if you can really 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 get in tune with officers who you know got this stuff together you're going to succeed I, I couldn't believe it because I know what type of officer Norm was. He was very officer safety, conscious, uh, knowledgeable, tactics, everything. And I said, no, that, 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 that can't be him. I, I was in uh, disbelief. And then once it was confirmed that once realization hit, you know, my whole, I was just numb. I was just numb and shot, couldn't move, you know. So, so it was one of the worst days of my life. You're listening to the ATO Bridging the Divide podcast, brought to you by the Assist the Officer Foundation. Since 1999, the ATO has given assistance to the first responder community, and now we want to give them a platform to hear their incredible stories. We also want to hear the stories of the many people that support us. Our community is small, but it is strong. We have differences. We don't always agree. And we all make mistakes. But together we can grow. We can heal. And we can learn from those mistakes. And together we can bridge the divide. Modern community policing has its roots in a set of principles put forth by Sir Robert Peel, the UK Prime Minister who created London's Metropolitan Police in 1822. These timeless ideals summarize the essential components for police success to prevent crime and maintain order. Three of the most important tactical elements of community policing are positive interaction, partnerships, and problem solving. Today's guest has made a career of not only enforcing the law, but also he has put an emphasis on engaging the community that he serves. He hired on in 1992. In December of 1993, he joined the gang unit. And from 93 to 2004, he worked in the Dallas gang unit. In 1997, he formed a gang intervention program called GCOP. The mission of this program was to reach the youth and form a relationship, more community policing hopefully steering them away from the gang life, which is in the southern part of Dallas, that's very hard to do. Working gangs in Dallas and community relations has been the man's life, his passion. Today, the listener is going to hear from the story from the DPD Major Leroy Quigg. Major Quigg, the ATO stage is yours. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that um, introduction. uh, I've always took pride in being a Dallas police officer. That, that, that's why I've been doing it over 30 years and over 20 years in the gang unit. So, so, so thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, man. I've, I've been trying to get you on here for months. Back, I, I think you were a sergeant when I was first trying to get you on. Yes, I hear you yes. are a major. You've been standing me up ever <laughs> since right. then. <laughs> Our schedules are busy. You're a busy man, especially yes, now. Yes. You're, when, when did you promote to major? Uh, January 19th. All right. Last January. So, yeah, so you're brand new. Long overdue, by the way. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. You ready to dive into this? Let's go. All right. Where were you born? 
I was born in Toledo, Ohio. Um, I went to Central Catholic High School and the University of Toledo. So I'm I'm Ohioan. All right. You watch shows such as Hawaii Five-0, Adam 12, Hill Street Blues. Did that help you want to get into the career of law enforcement? Yes. I, you know, growing up, I wanted to do one or two things. Be a life, be a lifer in the United States Army, or be in law enforcement. So uh, I wasn't a lifer in the United States Army. I only spent four years in the Army, but I ended up being a life here, a lifer in the uh, Dallas Police Department. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Was there ever a point where you wanted to? When you got into the Army, in uh, was eighty seven? Yes. Okay. That's back when the Browns were that close. Yep. If it wasn't for John Elway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The it drive. Ernest, and the Bi- Ernest Biner yes, fumble. Yeah. Yes, yes. But, but hey, new, this is a new generation. It, so it is. Hey, new hopes. Kozar, they were good. They had, some, they had a hell of a receiving core in Kozar. We went to about three or four AFC championships. And if and it just, wasn't just for lost. Elway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go back to the Army. When you were in the Army, did, was there a point where you just you were thinking, I'm going to go with this. I'm going to make a career out of this. Uh, in the army, mm-hmm. uh, at, at first, you know, I, you know, one of the movies that prompted me to join the army was Platoon. So, yeah, so I got, I, I got, I got motivated in, in that, and then, you know, uh, uh, I joined the army. But after about two or three years, I, I said, you know, there's something more that I can do. Just, you know, just, 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 just to do more in life. Now, I don't want to take it away, you know. I wanted to be a, a, a in, in special forces and stuff like that, and I, I was always gun ho. And, and you know what? I take my hat off, and, and I honor those men, men and women who are actually doing that, that type of work. Matter of fact, my fiance, my ex fiance, uh, she's still in the army, so you know she made a good career out of it. But I just, I just realized that hey, you know, I, I want to, I, I want to go into law enforcement. So you that, wanted to be a cop. I wanted to be a cop. Shows like Hawaii Five O, you know, yes, China. Adam Twelve, yeah. all, all those movies, all those movies. All right, why did you apply to Dallas? I mean, how did you get connected with Texas? And well, did you apply anywhere else? I, yeah, I play, of course I played in in, in Ohio, Toledo, um, but uh, the reason why I actually chose Dallas, I was I, I was stationed at Fort Hood when I was in the Army, and my ex fiance back then, she was still in the Army. Huh. And uh, she knew I wanted to get out, but uh, I applied different police departments, and um, Dallas called me, so I, I've been here ever since. Yeah, so she, yeah, back then police, did you try for Cleveland? No, no, I, I, I didn't apply for Cleveland. How big a department is Cleveland? Ooh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I know the population is about 392,000, so I, if I'm guessing, maybe eight, 900, I'm, I'm okay. not sure. Was Dallas the biggest department you applied yes, for? Okay, yes. and what kind of reputation did did in your eyes did Dallas have? Oh, Dallas had a, a good reputation. Yeah, especially back in the you know early nineties and late eighties. What'd you Where, think about the Cowboys back then? <laughs> wow, you go put me on the spot with that, right? <laughs> yeah, we have a few Dallas Cowboy fans. I listening. must admit, I must admit, I must admit, I must admit. Growing up, I was a big Roger Staubach fan. Oh yeah. So I liked the Cowboys, and I liked Cleveland. Yeah, but then when I came to Dallas, it changed, and then I, I guess you know I was longing for home. So then Cleveland, I had to represent Ohio. Mm-hmm. Cleveland became my number one team. All right. No, I've always you know honestly it, those those I keep bringing up Elway, and I'm oh. sure it just, it just galls you to hear that yes. that name. But that Elway was my favorite quarterback until Troy Aikman got drafted by the Cowboys, and they and they all they kind of reminded me of each other a little bit. But it, Aikman didn't have El, Elway's legs. Um, but the Browns, I always liked Kozar, and I always liked Biner, and and those games were just, you know, back to back years from back the one yard years. line. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, those heartbreaking. The drive one and two, yeah. Uh, but I've always liked the Brown. I like the history of the Browns, mm-hmm. you know, and going back to Jim Brown, uh, in in those days, what, is that your who was your favorite Brown? Jim Brown, of Jim course. Brown, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people, and I and I. And I, you're not an Art Modell fan, are you? No. Yeah. No, he he, no. he pulled the pulled the rug out and took off in the middle of the night to to Baltimore. For the listeners, the the owner sold the Browns and took off to Baltimore, and then they didn't have a team for like what, a couple of years or yeah, three about, years, about two three years. two or three years, and they brought the dog pound back. And, and Belichick, and, Belichick was our coach. That's right, then. Belichick. Yep. 
Um, so we hired on Dallas in '92. We still at White Rock, the the academy. Where was the academy? No, no, it was at Redbird. Oh, was it already? Right. Okay, still at Redbird. Okay. Um, where did you go after you you got out of the academy? Got out of the academy. I went to Central Patrol. Okay. I went through Central Patrol um, through training. Uh, once I um, got off of training and probation, I, then I went to Southeast. Mm. And that was in 93. Went to Southeast. I was there for about six months. And then they asked for volunteers to the gang unit. So I volunteered, and I was in the gang unit ever since then. So now you you, you had in your bio that you volunteered to go to the gang yes. unit. Yes, yes. So how, how long had the gang unit been going on? When you got over there? I think the gang unit was, um, Sergeant Langford was a sergeant over the gang unit okay. at that time. And I think the gang unit started in 1989, I believe. Okay, so it was still fairly new. It was fairily new. How yes. what was the size of it? At that time, <clears throat> they only had maybe 10 officers. Damn. If that, included, including detectives. But what prompted uh, the increase of the size of the gang unit back in 1993, there was a shooting of a, of a prominent uh uh, business owner, and then that's when everybody was drafting to co- come to the gang unit and got up to, at one point, like 60 officers, but then it reduced down to about around 30. That's how, I mean, that, there's always something that happens yep. in, in, in an department. I mean, hell, you know, when the narcotics unit, the street squads hit, they were formed and went from eight officers uh, when we had Chief Kowalski on, and he mm-hmm. was talking about there was eight detectives and narcotics and then we had the jamaican drug wars that went on i know you remember that mm-hmm. and then they they beefed it up to 120 uh detectives which is which is ridiculous and the same happened to swat too swat swelled they had a b c d e unit now that it has an a and e unit right mm-hmm. so it's 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 crazy how little incidents like that 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 prompt the department to adjust and to basically swell right. a, 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 a pro a, a unit so I want to get into that movie Colors. That movie Colors, I, I remember seeing it. It was, it was in the late eighties. Do you do you remember that? Yes, I do. Did you do you believe that movie? I mean, I had not heard of the Crips and Bloods, and I think that was the rise of them over there in, in California, in the West Coast. Do you think that that movie kind of prompted the the popularity of the gang? I I, I, I definitely do. I, I, it, it played a, a strong factor in. Uh, what happened across the nation after that movie? So I, I think I, th- I think it, it it impacted it. Yeah. So when I I grew up, you know, I grew up in Dallas, and um, I actually went to my f- freshman year. I went to Griner and Atwell over there in, in Oak Cliff, and then <laughs> and then yeah. Actually, so I went to my wow. freshman year. I went to Sunset, wow. and they had so many offshoots of these gangs. It was like mm-hmm. Ducky Boys, G Man, mm-hmm. all these just spare want to be gangs and but you know the crips and bloods were kind of the main ones that people were trying to emulate and i think it was from that you know that that's it was just the popularity and the growth from the right. west coast heading right basically heading east mm-hmm. and southeast what were the, some of the big gangs when you first got over there uh 415 bloods trade five seven dixon boys still there bond town double seven uh it used to be called bear street bloods uh, well, they flip flopped. They went back and forth from Bloods. They were Bloods one week and Crips the final week. <clears throat> then we had uh, Web Chapel rolling sixties. We had PGV Pleasant Grove Vatos, Avario Thirteen, which is another Hispanic gang. Uh, East Side Homeboys was big. They had East Side Homeboys, Locos. Um, who else? Um, T- Tango Blast even came, yeah. came came to Dallas for a little while, especially in North Dallas. So so we had th- those were our largest gangs. Were they were they offshoots of the Bloods and Crips? Pretty much most of them. Pretty much, yes. Okay, and, and in the southeast, mm-hmm. in the southern sectors, mm-hmm. that's what they they really mm-hmm. were terrorizing those mm-hmm. neighborhoods, right? Yeah, yeah. And they and they still are, they still are. And they were actually, you know, South Dallas is small, and they actually were defined in the geographical areas too as well. Oh yeah. So you know you know you had different high schools where one gang and the other another gang, and the kids go. Three miles down the road, you're in another gang territory, rival ter- territory. Well, it, when it comes to South Dallas, like uh, um, used to be Oakland, mm-hmm. Oakland. Uh, mm-hmm. Right now, now it's Michael Max. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah you know, forty four OG Bloods. Yeah, and they kind of that kind of splits the gangs. Mm-hmm. Then you go over to Mill City, and it goes up to the Bloods. You mm-hmm. go up around Fair Park, and mm-hmm. that's more 
blood occupied, mm-hmm. right? And then you go down a little further south, that's that's, that's the Crips. Well, look at you. I got, you, I got a little you, you bit of knowledge. You've been around. I see that. I've been, I've, yeah, I worked southeast for a little bit. Um, I pay attention. But, yeah, you, your reputation, Quig, was, you know. You, well, they used to call me Curly Top until I started losing some of my hair. <laughs> hey, so. you held on to it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to hold on to it. <laughs> hey, shit, I mean, my, mine's just gray. I've got old and gray. Um what were the pro- predominant race of these gangs that, that you were seeing pop up? Uh, predominantly just Hispanic and, and African Americans. Okay. Did were there any Asian gangs in Dallas? There were, but the Asian gangs were pretty much mobile. What what they would, would like to do is do um, home invasions. Oh, go to another city, hit, hit a lick, and then come back. But but they were more preppy. You know, they were yeah. further further north Dallas, and, and they weren't as visible. As African Americans and Hispanic gangs. Why do you think that is? Out, this they're, they're just low key. Okay. Just low key. And um, were they big, big gangs though? Uh no, no, not for this city. No, not for this city. Okay. Not, there are other parts of the country. They're, yes. they're big. Yes. And yes. they're more, or, much more organized. Right? Yes. Right. Yes. Um, what kind of crimes did you see being in the gang unit that they gravitated to? Is and what they kind of they had a special specialized craft what was it drugs yeah drug drug drugs was big of course your aggravated assaults you know when they're robbing other dope houses or each other and then uh aggravated assaults shooting and then you know of course homicides do you yeah well when they're shooting at somebody they yeah. ain't shooting at them nope. just to shoot a gun out of their hand mm-hmm. or, or wounding them they're usually no, shooting to kill not right? a long ranger no no they ain't that they ain't that good a shot um d- did you see back in the Back in the late nineties, I want to get into the because you saw the gang unit from the nineties up until what's going on today, Mm -hmm. right? What kind of shift did you see in a change in the gang, the street gangs from then to now? Like as far as aggression, did did you see a lot more aggression towards non gang members, or was there was there aggression in their shootings more just other gang members, and that's part of the game, or or both? Pretty much it's been always gang on gang. Okay. You know, of course, you know, innocent civilians got caught in the crossfire or what have you. But they were just pretty much rivaling against each other, you know, especially especially with the drug trade. Yeah. So, you know, trying to take over the drug areas, drug to- territories or what have you. So it, it was pretty much gang on gang. Well, it's territorial. I yeah, mean, territory, you, exactly. You don't even dope dealers that are, you know, there aren't many dope dealers in South Dallas that aren't that aren't associated with, with a gang, right? Because right. they, they get into that. It adds a layer of protection, and then uh, they're basically they hide behind a symbol too. But you do you have to sell dope if you're in a gang at a certain part of, a, of, of town, right? Otherwise, it's, it's basically the territory. Otherwise, you try to go sell. Let, let's say somebody from uh, Mill City tries to go down and sell on Dixon. 2700 Dixon. You're going to get, that's where you're going to get Murder mm-hmm. stacking up, yep, right, and that's why because they're they're defending their their territory that they claim they got to hold that through violence basically, and that's how it's always been, that's how it still is. Mm-hmm. Um, you formed GI Cop Program. What is that, and why did you why did you form that? Why did you see a need for that? I formed that right around ninety seven. So I, I was on I was in, I was in the gang unit for maybe about three or four years, and. Uh, like I said, I, I I was always, I was always, gun ho, especially when I was younger. I was always gun ho, you know, uh, and that, that that's why I wanted to join the gang unit because I wanted to be proactive. I, I want to try to take the, you know, people off the streets, especially after seeing colors that riled me up too. So I said, yeah, you know what, I want to I, I want to try to get these gang members off the street. Well, the nexus of crime linked to them. I mean, they were exactly. they were the center, exactly. the epicenter of that. Yeah, exactly. So. After doing that about three years, I, I sat back. I said, "You know what? I'm arresting the same individuals. You know, I'm sp- I'm spinning my wheels. What can I do differently to really try to make an impact on the community?" And so, there was a drive-by shooting at one of the high schools in, in South Dallas, and a young a young kid got killed. Fifteen year old got killed 500 yards from his high school campus. And I said to myself, there's something more that I can do, not just as an officer, but as a person, to really try to impact these kids' lives and put them on the right direction so they'll be 
productive and law-abiding citizen. So I formed a program called GI Cop Gang Intervention Community Outreach Program. And <clears throat> pretty much what I was trying to do is, is try to give them alternatives. And so I, I had I had an umbrella of different resources uh, that I provided them, you know, counseling, uh, after school programming, athletics, especially with athletics. We was doing basketball going throughout throughout the whole, you know, country, GI soldiers. And so we was actually really trying to make an impact. Now, I had some good stories and I had some bad stories, you know, but I was I was really trying to do something different because you know, I'm I'm saying, you know, this young kid got killed in South Dallas and it was a little blurp on the news. You know, this kid's life is gone. And so I'm I, I was really trying to reduce that of kids getting killed or kids getting caught in gangs or or ca- get caught in the system so you know that's that's why i formed the program well that that's a big deal to kind of and, it, and it, it is a model of community policing right mm-hmm. you, you you're engaged in the community and then also you're you're forming a relationship with these kids right because a lot of these kids don't have fathers nope or they don't have strong family members to, to support them and encourage them not to do something in, in some cases they have family members that are encouraging them so, to go some that family life. members are in gangs absolutely so uh that's the thing we we, we wanted to be, well we wanted to have consistency in their lives because they don't have consistency in their life you know you know when we first approach them we're first talking about different programs they're leery yeah right whatever you know i heard this before so that that's why you have, have consistency in these kids lives in order to um affect a change and <clears throat> that's why i i you know i i love chief uh, garcia's uh uh a crime plan and his perspective, you know, especially when it comes to proactive policing plus community engagement equals a reduction in crime. That's what we got to do in order to really reduce crime is really engage these kids and, 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 and give them hope. You could save a life. Uh, exactly. You know, exactly. He's, the, the, that gang and dope trade, there aren't, I used to always say there, there's not many, you don't see too many, too many old dope dealers. Nope. They're either dead they, or they're in jail. They, they don't retire. No, right. Yeah. Don't retire. And then, you know, there was there's there's it's generational too. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I when I first hired on, I'm not gonna mention the names, there was some there was a group of guys and they were bloods. They were selling dope in South Dallas and then right there before I left the streets, I was arresting their his <laughs> yep. kids, you I, know. I, I'm in the same boat as you. Yeah. Um can you describe to the listener who Lamont Levels is and how y'all met about his story? Okay. Lamont Level is a former four one five gay member. Uh, matter of fact, he and eight other individuals formed that gang back in the early 90s, 415 Bloods. <clears throat> and he was a gang member. Uh, I used to chase him around all the time. Uh, I would catch him, too. He, he he wouldn't admit that, though, but I did catch him. I was fast back in the day. So uh, finally, in uh, 2002, he was doing a drug buy, and um, he got shot. His own gang, his own gang shot him in the head, and he's blind. So <clears throat> shortly after, thereafter, maybe about six months later, I ran into him again. Matter of fact, uh, I arrested his brother. And, uh, but but at, at the end of the day, I was able to get his brother a job at this boot camp, right? And so he was helping kids and talking to kids. And so that's when he wanted to bring Lamont on board. And I said, sure, I remember Lamont. And so from that point on, we, we was the dynamic duel. And, and, <clears throat> and see, not only... For the optics of it, it's you have a Dallas police officer, a gang unit officer, mm-hmm. with a gang member, right? And we would go to all the schools in DISD and, and even abroad and talk to kids about gang intervention programs and gang awareness, the dangers of, of becoming involved in gangs. He would tell his story, and what he would tell the kids is it took God to close his eyes in order for him to see. So that was deep, and the kids gravitized him like he was some rapper. And we touch a lot of lives. We change a lot of kids' lives. And that's, that goes to show you that, you know what, if a gang member and a police officer can become the best of friends and have a, have a common goal in trying to reduce crime and trying to save as many people, then gang, gang members can turn their lives around and, and work with other gang members, rival gang members. So that, that's the narrative that we was trying to really push out uh, to the community. Oh man, that's great! And I've, 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 I know his. I knew his story. I just want the listeners to, to hear uh, his stories and y'all's partnership. Uh, when y'all first started going around, 
was there uh, was there more leeriness and and and, a, and a cynicism you had to deal with well, from the gang from the the young minds? You talking about the kids? Yeah, the, the kids. The members. kids. Yeah. At first, they really didn't trust me. And see, the beauty of this was Lamont gave credibility to me as a police officer to the kids. That's how I got in, right? And then vice versa, I was able to get validity and credibility to Lamont to the police officers mm. so they can trust them and talk to them and, you know, and, 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 and interact with them as well. So we worked well with one another. And once we got that validity on both sides, yeah, it, it took off. It took off. What, did he ever? Did he ever talk to you about what? What about getting shot? And what about the, his recovery made him wake up and see things differently, so to speak? Well, he, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, because that's some of the questions that the kids would ask him. You know, during our during our tour of all the schools, and he said, "Your friends are like buttons in the elevator. They can either take you up or bring you down." Okay, and so and so the thing is that he said he really found out, even though he can't see no more, he found out who his friends were. All those friends that he was flossing and, you know, making you know, make making his money rain and buying them jewelry and, you know, gifts and fair park passes, what have you, those same friends weren't there for him when he was down and out, when he was laying in bed, can't see, they didn't give him any encouragement. And the only ones that really gave encouragement was his own family. And he realized that, hey, I need to separate from my from, from myself. And not only that, his own gang member, his own gang set him up and shot him. So so he really separated himself from that from that type of, you know. It's a snake pit. Associations. It's a snake exactly. pit world. There's no honor among thieves. So. No, no. And, and everybody's trying to get a leg up. Everybody's trying exactly. to, to exactly. get, everybody wants higher ranking, right? Mm-hmm. It's, mm-hmm. man. It, and people don't realize how, they just don't realize how bad gang unit, the gangs are in major cities. Mm-hmm. Every major city's got them mm-hmm. to different degrees. And, and, uh, and here in Dallas, they're pretty entrenched. And, and some of them are long lasting. And um, the gang unit, how, how many, Members of the gang you have now, do you know about? Oh, I'm not sure, but it, I think it's up upwards in the 20s somewhere. Okay, in the 20s. So, so it increased. It's increased a little yes. bit. Okay. Where did your pa- you you said you wanted to make a difference as you kept going and you and you kind of honing your craft at, at going out and speaking to these kids mm-hmm. and to these uh, adult members? Did you have a lot of resistance from the the hardcore the uh, adult members of these gangs when you first started? No, not really, because my type of policing was, even though back when I was younger, I was very, how do I want to put this? I was very gut hole, okay? Yeah. But at the same time, when I made their arrests and taken them to jail, I always educated them. I said, dude, you can't be doing this. Why are you doing this? You you, you can do so much more. So I would, I would preach to them. You know, I would preach to them as we're going to jail. So over over a period of time, I really encountered most of the gang members, or especially the, the, the hardcore ones, and so they knew what my philosophy was. And so they actually, <clears throat> sometimes you police officers talk to people, right, especially mm-hmm. gang members, and they don't listen to them. They don't care. You know, they, they ignore them, look the other way, diss them, whatever. But with me, and especially with Norm, when we spoke, they actually listened because they knew we're just doing our job, but we actually cared about them. So that that happened. This has happened overnight. That's you. You got to do a whole career in order to really get that that interaction, that rapport with people. Well, I'm glad you brought up Norm. I've had on, I've had on uh, Tina, and I've had on uh, Foy and uh, Darian, and, and and each of them gave a perspective of of uh, of Norm and and what he was to the gang unit. Um, you, you worked with Norm for, for quite a while, right? Yes, we, we were partners. Okay, you're partners. Okay. Can you tell the listener from your perspective of partnership a little bit about Norm? Well, well, me and Norm became partners, I want to say, right around 97 to okay. about 2004. And matter of fact, he's the one who slowed me down. He's the one who slowed me down and uh, I said, you know, Leroy, you can't do all this. You need to slow down. You need to, you know, really talk to these people. So he's the one who really changed my perspective of policing, okay, because he, he, he was one of the best knowledgeable gang unit officers that the gang unit 
has ever had, even up to this point, too. And uh, matter of fact, he was one of the, you know, you, you have your rank structure. You got your sergeants, you got your lieutenants, you got your chiefs, you got your majors. But he was the real leader as a PO. He was one of those type of guys where people actually gravitate towards him, listen to what he has to say because he was very knowledgeable. And so that that that's how we were able to really reach a lot of a lot of kids in South Dallas. I mean, matter of fact, throughout the city of Dallas, because um, his his knowledge and and his caring for the community, you know, uh, and, and and that was and that and that was um, noticeable on on his vigil. All the game members throughout the city of Dallas attended his vigil. I'm talking these hardcore gamers like he was talking mm-hmm. about because it, like I said, it takes a period of time to really reach these guys. Even though, even though they know they're doing bad, but they also can recognize somebody who's actually f- helped, trying to trying to help them out. So, and, and that's what Norm was about. It was about respect. Exactly. They they respected him. Exactly. Um, were you working the night that uh, it, that Norm was, was no, killed? No, no. The night the the weekend prior, we were looking for the suspect in in, in Oak Cliff. Uh, he's playing cat and mouse, mm-hmm. and at that time, I was a detective. I, I wasn't on the streets any longer. I, I was a detective. So we, we, we was looking for him. You know, he had his sources and what have you. And so that night, I left. I went home, you know. Um, so so I, I wasn't there at, on, on that night. When you got that call, what, how was I, that? I, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it because I know what type of officer Norm was. He was very officer safety, conscience, uh, knowledgeable tactics everything and i said no that, 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 that can't be him i, I was in uh, disbelief and then once it was confirmed and once realization hit you know my whole i was just numb i'm just numb and shot couldn't move you know so so it was one of the worst days of my life well you know like i said we've had on some other people that were mentored that, that norm mentored mm-hmm. And and I'm hearing this from you. I mean, you yeah, know, he was a leader. He was a, he he was a natural born leader. He touched so many people's exactly. lives. And mm-hmm. now look and now look at now look at the people, the lives that he's touched. Mm-hmm. You're a major. Mm-hmm. Foy's a chief. Tina's mm-hmm. a chief. Mm-hmm. Darian's up an F, FBI. Mm-hmm. Been on gang unit or gang unit SWAT. Uh, you know, he's that means a lot. That tutelage like that. Mm-hmm. It translates to success, not only just on the streets, but also in a profession. Right, right. He, uh, it's it's so impressive. He was such a loss for this mm-hmm. city and for this department. Yes, yes, yes. He was. Um, what was what? Did you notice a change in the gang unit as a whole after uh, after Norm's death? I think I think like you know, like I said, he was one of your natural leaders. Even the sergeants and the lieutenants and the chiefs respected his decision that's how that's how powerful he was influential he was you know so so everybody respected him so when that when that happened that that would be like you know we we lost we lost our body and soul in the gang unit so then you know the gang has been going ups and downs you know uh since his loss and 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 it took it took a big effect on the gang unit, and not not only the gang unit, but the community as well. Yeah, it, it's still. I don't think it's ever it, it's it's ever gonna be the same that it was what y'all what y'all had back in the in the, uh, mid nineties, late nineties, and early two thousands. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's. I don't know if it's gonna it's gonna get to that back to that point because y- y'all had a. What I noticed before I left the streets was officers don't they don't know how to talk to people exactly and and some of my best relationships with some of them dealers out in south dallas was it was a cat and mouse game mm. they knew what they were doing they knew, i have a role and they have a role mm. and sometimes we just cross paths Tom and jerry mm. yeah exactly and and they respect i there were some of the hardest dope dealers i could i dealt with that would give fist fist bumps whenever we we talked to each other yep yep if it, now if they didn't fist bump me i knew they they were holding or they they were, they they had something on them, right? exactly. But there's just not a lot of that anymore, and there's just um, it's just a different style of policing, and, and just the perception of policing is different. And and and, and that's what we're, what we're trying to do with the recruits. We got recruits coming out of the academy, right? And uh, we have them come over to the community affairs enrichment program. And to me, I think that is an 
excellent idea, you know, because they're still on training, right? They only come here for a week. They're still on training, but we're able to try to get them more and act with the community, you know, learn how to talk to people. We, we bring them to our crime watch meetings. They can see, they can see, uh, uh, how we interact with them or how, how, what people think or some of the things that they have to deal with. So when they go back to the patrol stations and learn from their FTOs, they can put that in their toolbox and be able to say, you know what? I learned this from community affairs. I learned this from NPOs, how to really interact with somebody who may have gone through a traumatic, you know, ordeal, you know, so I, I, and that, and that's helped molding the young minds and actually, actually trying to get that interviewing techniques back what's well, exposure you're exposing them to exactly. just, just talking to people just exactly. talking whether it's a suspect or a witness or mm-hmm. a complainant or sometimes both they can be a you know a a, a suspect or a, a gangbanger could turn into a victim in a hurry or a yep. witness right yep and you got to know how to talk to folks it, you can get a lot having rapport rapport and you can ask any detective on the department you get rapport you can get a lot going with an interview, mm-hmm. right? And it ain't just sitting in an interview room mm-hmm. in a club behind a closed door. It's out in the field mm-hmm. in an active situation. You can get, you can get a lot of information if you know how to talk to people. And then if you get in and get with the community, they're the people that live right. amongst the shit. Right. They 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 are there. They got the they got their ear to the ground. That's that that that's why um, Norm was able to get so many tips from everybody throughout the city on different crimes because he, he established that report not with just one person, but with a bunch of people, you know, and 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 then he would be able to, uh, you know, uh, play it off with the other tips that he got to see, hey, is this a confirmation? And that's how he was able to solve a lot of crimes because Norm solved a lot of crimes, yeah. a lot of crimes. Homicide so, and assaults and yeah, robberies were going to you guys yeah, all the time. Yeah, they, they set up a desk. Matter of fact, back in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s, they would have a desk in our in our gang unit office, you know, so because they knew we were actually going out there and being proactive and really trying to hunt down these individuals. Well, because a, the, a lot of the homicides were gang-related. Yep, yep, right? well, yes. It's, it's, that, still, that still stands. Yes, this day. yes. In, to, in, in 2019, you organized some community events to help families overcome barriers mm-hmm. in life. Uh, can you explain these? Okay. Uh, the first community event uh, was called Enough is Enough. And what that was was trying to stop the violence. Okay. And we held that at the African American Museum in South Dallas. And the reason why I held it there is because the majority of the individuals who were getting you know, getting killed were African Americans. It was black and black crimes. And what I was trying to do is just bring them back to their roots. So that 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 that's why we held it at the African American Museum. It had about three three four hundred people, and it was a positive turnout. Matter of fact, um, uh, getting getting to the black roots. I had all the politi- all the politicians and the chief police at that time were all black. And so I wanted these young kids to see and say, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. And so we had a panel discussion. We brought in other speakers. Lamont spoke, matter of fact. And it, it was a pretty good deal. Just recently, I want to say about two months ago, we did Enough is Enough too, at the Juanita Rec Craft Center. Uh, chief Garcia came out panel discussion and and it was it was very 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 educational positive positive we gave out resources and 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 the community was able to vent but they weren't venting at the police you know they weren't throwing rocks at the police like they always they were talking about how can we make our community safer you know and so they they wanted to come together we all come together and try to come up with a plan and trying to make south dallas a safer place to live yeah, people want to live in peace. Exactly. I mean, exactly. damn, life's hard enough without you know. And I and I understand. I believe me, I understand that I understand the gang and their intentions and, and what they're about. Mm-hmm. And, and and most of it's money, right? Mm-hmm. It's money and power. But some of these guys, if they they feel, especially if they grow up in it, they mm-hmm. don't have anything else. If they, they don't have nothing. anybody to mentor them, they don't know any better. They just go along with, with what they what they're used to and what they've grown in to know what life is. And, and, and that's why a lot of kids get caught up in gangs. They get caught up in gangs because of economic reasons, uh, lack of uh, uh, family. Like, uh, lack of opportunity. Uh, yeah, lack of opportunity, education, in the area they live in. Now, that ain't a, a big excuse because 
you know, you got to take you got to take your Absolutely. take take your own responsibility, yeah. your own accountability, yeah. accountability to to overcome those deals, though. But but those are some of the, some of, some of these kids that have low self confidence in themselves, and that's why they get caught up in the, caught up in these things. So, you know, let's uh, let's talk some barber barbershop talk. Okay, tell me about that that program. Okay, uh, I'm going to go back to the first question you asked okay. me about, about the TV shows, Adam Twelve. Or okay, whatever, right? okay. And so what we've done was created actually i got to give this to officer edmund tony edmonds from southeast patrol he has some friends who has barbershop talks in atlanta and in memphis and so so we have also also connected connected with them clippers and cops okay and so what we call our barbershop talk here in dallas getting faded with 12 where do you think i got 12 from adam 12 adam 12 so what it is is now the ki- that the kids and the game members don't call us Five zero as much. They call us twelve. Really? Matter okay. of fact, matter of fact, I was watching power, and I didn't even know it. And I'm gang unit twenty three plus. Yeah, I was watching power, and Fifty Cent was talking to Tariq, and they were about to get pulled over. He said, "Okay, chill out. Twelve was about to get us." Damn. Meaning police. Yeah. And then I get on the streets and I talk to some of my gang member friends. Yeah, that's that, that's that's the new that's the new name for police is twelve. So that's why I got the name Getting Faded with 12, police officer giving them a haircut. So so that was a pretty good deal. And pretty much what that is, is we go into the barbershops, and, we, and of course I get permission from the owner, right? And uh, he agrees to it. And then what we do is come in plain clothes. Now, I have a couple officers in uniform just in case, you know, just, but we come in plain clothes and we start talking about, I talk about how the Cowboys are going to get beat and, you know, they're going to have a terrible record and the Browns are going to go to the playoffs and everybody laughed me at the barbershop. Yeah. So that's the way I can break down that, break down that barrier. Now, now they know you're, they know you're police when you come in there plain clothes. Some, some of them. Okay. Do, okay. Well, well, the clients don't know at first. The, okay. All the barbers do, but uh, the ones who get in their haircuts don't know. Okay. 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 And then, but but then we tell them we're, we're officers. But we get stimulating conversations. I mean, we tell them out. We want tough questions. A question that you never was able to ask a police officer. Because why? You either answering a call, writing a ticket, or taking somebody to jail, right? So you never really have that in a relationship with the officer. And I said, don't don't worry about the question. Or, or your answers because there's not going to be any ramifications from it. We really want to know what you're thinking. So we're actually trying to tear down that barrier between the police and the community and vice versa, the community and the police, right? And so so we talk, We you know, a lot of questions like how to conduct yourself on traffic top. Those discussions come up. How, how, IAD questions come up. Uh, how to conduct yourself on, uh, you know, I said that, conduct yourself on a traffic stop. So it's so different, different um Questions come up. Why did DPS come to South Dallas? You know, so those are questions that we really ask. As a matter of fact, I had this one individual where he raised his hand. He said, well, what can I do to help South Dallas? What can I do? I live in Rockwall. What can I do? And he's an African-American man. He said, I want to do jitsu. I want to do jitsu mm, dojo. Yeah. And so I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, I want to bring jujitsu to South Dallas where kids can ha- have free lessons so we worked on that we got with parks and recs now we have three locations south dallas and two locations south dallas one location no four locations one location in oak cliff and one location in um north dallas off of forest and delia and this is a brother who just bringing his talents and his and he he pays for everything the, the little geese the whole nine yeah, yards that ain't that ain't cheap either and we have about 60 kids who are involved in uh, jiu-jitsu, but it's not just jiu-jitsu, but it's also anti-bullying programs at the same mm-hmm. time because jiu-jitsu, you got to have discipline. So right. you have discipline, anti-bullying programs, and then also self-defense. So those are the type of things that we can get from, because people laugh, stuff our barbershop talk. No, it actually actually works. It actually works, and, and people want to get involved. So, so now uh, I'm the major of community affairs, so I've instructed all my sergeants, you know, from all seven divisions, I need at least two or three barbershops on each uh, on the, at each division where we can actually uh, make a difference and actually start trying to tear down that negative perception of you know of of officers. And then not only that, bring some patrol officers so they can it's like recruits, so they can actually see what the community wants, and we can come to a comp- come to the compromising and policing. Yeah, we're not always going to hell. We don't even agree agree yeah, as yeah, cops. Yeah, exactly, and, and agree. 
we're not always going to exactly. agree with a citizen to cop, mm-hmm. cop citizen. It's but there is always middle ground that can be exactly be found if you tr- if you want to if you matter, look for it. Matter of fact, I had this one officer see one particular barbershop said, "I want to get a perspective of white officers." So can you bring white officers to the barbershop? So I did. So there's one officer. He's a lieutenant. You know, he came, and the first minute he walked through the front door. You know, like, like I said, hey, guys, ask the tough questions. Don't worry about the ramifications. Just ask it. Well, uh, the, the, actually, the owner of the barber said, you know what? What about him? I said, okay, he, he's a good officer. He said, well, and this officer, let me paint a picture of him. He's about 5'10", totally bald-headed. Sometimes he got a little scowl on his face. So mm-hmm. what, do you think, what do you think they thought he was? Right out of Deep Grove. He th- yeah. thought he was a racist, right? Yeah. Red KKK, neck. Yeah. right? Yeah. So he said, well, I think he's a racist, the the barber guy. He's, without even talking to him. Without even talking okay. to him, his okay. perception. Right. So you know where I'm going with that. Yep. So so, so that particular officer said, well, no, 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 I'm not a racist. This is just the way I, 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 I actually you know look. I've been working in South Dallas, uh, Oak Cliff, Southwest, my whole career, I, I don't have a prejudice bone in my body. But from that perception, you know, I said, I said, okay, I said, Shorty, I said, you perceived him as being a racist, right? Right, right from the get, right? And he's not. But that's why that's sometimes how officers stereotype individuals on the street. Yep. And 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 they may be wrong, just like you're wrong. And that's why we got to learn to really interact with each other and actually have conversate with each other. Now that particular officer goes to the shop every two weeks to get his head shaved. So that was, that is the barriers that we're actually tearing down with not with the community, but with officers as well. Right. I love it, man. That's that's great. Now that that's uh, that's needed, you know. And that and that's one thing. And I always say that this purpose of this podcast is to get different perspectives so you got a white officer going in and just by the look of him they they assumed or they thought he was racist Mm -hmm. right that that there's that's a double-edged sword yep right sometimes they just see a uniform with us Mm -hmm. and and they hate us right or if we see somebody standing on the corner in a certain part of south Dallas, because of our experiences and what we used to do what we always assume it right that's why it's good to get to hear both sides because there's always a side to each yep. store. Yep. You called me out to Southeast, um, I don't know, about a year ago maybe, to, to, to talk to some young officers. Yes. It, yes. Why did you – and there were some some of your young heart – you were a lieutenant out there at Southeast. Why was that important to you to, to uh, get them – just some more information about policing. What, why that? Why why'd you do that? Because I don't. Not everybody does that. Because because I'm all about training and developing officers, right? And um, trust me, I need a lot of de- <laughs> I need a lot of training and developing myself when I was coming up as officers. Uh, maybe I, I, I wouldn't have made as many mistakes as I did. But I was noticed a trend where officers were making a lot of mistakes. You know, and I said that I said I can't. Me being a being a watch commander, I can't sit back and see. I call them my kids making these mistakes without me trying to correct them, and not only correct them, not just on discipline, but correct them and and develop them educational wise. So that that that's why I wanted you to come in and, and and talk about narcotics, talk about courtroom testimony, because I don't want them to get up get up. And it, with me, when, when I used to take the stand all the time. Like I said, I was very gung ho, so I would go back and forth with the lawyer. You know, yeah. instead of him asking me questions, I ended up asking him questions. He say, "Judge, he's, he's being non-responsive." So, but so I wanted I wanted them to be ta- taught by the expert, you, because I know you did a lot of courtroom testimonies. So th- they won't get up there and put their foot in their mouth or say the wrong things, to perjure themselves or whatever it may be, to try to make sure that the cases that they have are concrete concrete no gray areas and because that's that's what i tell all my i don't play in gray because if you play in gray you're going to get burned it's going to so catch up it's going to catch up so that's why i just wanted to bring in different people from different units you know to, to, to go with rest search and seizures go over courtroom testimony go over narcotics brought narcotics and, mm-hmm. and, and and they went over so I, I was just trying to develop my officers so they have more 
tools in their toolbox. So you're you're just equipping equipping them with, with exactly. knowledge and, knowledge and experience, and, right? Yes. And you know that's one thing. I'm I'm I've you know me since I've harped on courtroom testimony mm-hmm. for years years. Um, and that class that I, I taught in courtroom testimony, there's about not been anybody that has gone through it that for one really looks stellar, but there's not been anybody that walked away and say they didn't get something from it. Exactly. Getting up in front of getting up in front, uh, you know, in front of a mic, looking at twelve people, right? Mm-hmm. You're looking at the judge is over there, and you got the and you got the defendant, and you got the defense attorney, you got the prosecutor, and you got the some t- some cases the the uh, the defendant's family back there mean mugging you, right, and shaking mm-hmm. their head and looking at you like you're the biggest liar. And you need to that's that's stressful, right? You need to be eloquent you got you need to know what you're talking about and understand why you apply certain laws and be able to articulate why you did it right that's really important i I wish we did more of that uh as opposed to people just fumbling through it and learning as they go because that that could go very badly and some officers may get caught up on the stand be 100 percent right but some of these defense attorneys are slick Mm -hmm. that's their their job is to make us look bad and use smoke and mirrors to to basically get their defendant you know, mm-hmm. uh, off a case. And I, I get it. That's part of the game. That's part of the game too, as opposed to us doing surveillance and arresting dope dealer. The other part of that, just cause you take somebody to jail and drop them off, that doesn't end. Exactly. Right. It, that it, there, There's much more from a, a prosecutorial standpoint. Uh, I really, I, I love that you did that. And, 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 and your, and your guys were so receptive mm-hmm. and I, and I, and, and I like doing it cause I get to meet young officers and, and mm-hmm. uh, some of these people I've been off the street since 16 and I don't know every, I don't know a lot of street officers anymore. I know detectives, but not street officers. Right. Right. And, and I just don't believe in discipline. You know, we, we gotta, we gotta follow that up with some type of training, some type of education or whatever. So they re- repeat the same behavior or to repeat the same mistake, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you, 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 you kind of slap them on the hand, but then educate them so it doesn't happen again. Because mm-hmm. sometimes people do things and that just because they don't know any better. Mm-hmm. It's like some it's like some folks out in the streets that do things. They, don't, they grew up and they don't know any better. Right. Uh, then now that you're a major, uh, can you explain to the listener what your new role is? Okay. Uh, th- th- this is just uh, a perfect storm for me. I'm, I'm in community affairs, and I'm over all the NPO uh, MPO officers, neighborhood police officers throughout the city of Dallas. And I'm also over the community affairs downstairs as well. And our primary purpose is to engage the community, try to enhance the quality of life with different programs, different community events, basketball, you know, health and safety fairs, uh, uh, festivals, plays. That, 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 that's what we're actually, uh, our main purpose is. But not only that, um, again, Chief Garcia, uh, a couple about who in April, last April, we went to State Hutchins Jail. Uh, we had DPS, we had uh, ATF, we had we had FBI, we had different organizations coming and talking to a gr- a core group of individuals who are going to be released from prison in the next two months. And uh, what the message was to them is that hey, we're here. We put you here, but now you you're about to get out of jail, and now we want to help you. We want to help you get out of jail. Now, you got police officers standing outside the gate, you know, going to take them to whatever resources they need. Because we, we, we do an assessment while we're still in jail of what their needs are. Some may need housing. Others may need counseling. Another individual may need a job. And so we're, we're, there, we're here to try to equip, equip them with a job. A support staff. A support yeah. staff. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, um, we are uh, really working with this young individual. We call him White Chocolate, but his name's Richard. All right? right, he's a Hispanic male. He's about thirty years old. Tattoos all over his face. He lo- he looked like a Tupac, right? All right. But he went to jail for drugs. But he has a heart of gold, and now he's really want to change his life around. He's staying with his mother, so he got that 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 support staff at home. He has transportation, and he's a barber. But he's trying to get his barber's license, so we're going to we're in the, we're in the midst of trying to get him a barber's license. But I said I said I said Richard, uh, what's your short time goal? He said, Well, my short time goal is I want to get my barber's license. I said, Okay, what's your long term goal? Five year plan? He goes, Well, uh, Leroy, uh, I really want to own my own barber college, not barber shop. 
my own barber college. Not just to be a regular barber, but my own bar- barber college where you can empower other people and help uh, other people get on their feet and, you know, earn a job and show their creativity through cutting hair. And so he's everything we asked him to do, talking to mentors or showing up at these different appointments that we got planned out for him, he's done it. And so, matter of fact, Friday, uh, he finally met Chief Garcia to at this barber shop. And, and the reason why Chief Garcia went, he said, "Quick, I, you know, I, I love your barber shop, but I really wanted to meet Richard." And that made Richard's whole life, whole perspective. I mean, he already looked like a light bulb now. Now he really mm-hmm. looked like an LED light. Yeah. Because now he was so proud and happy and wanted to succeed that now. We actually sat down and he applied for his license and everything. So we're we're going to get the scholarship for him. And, and but those are type of stories that keeps keeps me motivated. That keeps other people motivated. I mean, Munoz, manager Munoz, is part of this. Bridget Sergeant Bridget Wilson is a part of this whole ordeal, and that's what keeps us really pushing forward and trying to reach out to uh, individuals. Because if we can change somebody's life coming out of prison. The chances of them to be a recidivism rate will go down and a crime rate will go down because they're not out there committing crimes. So we're really trying to really push forward and, and reach in all aspects of life and really make it, like I said, make a make a difference in their lives. So that's what the community fairs is about. Of course, we still do other things like homeless solutions and, you know, uh, radar detection or, or doing surveys at uh, convenience stores. But that part is what really gives me the passion. And, and, hey, I got 30 years plus on the police department. That motivates motivates me to go even further when you can really actually reach out and make somebody change somebody's life. Yeah, if you can change one life, it's change worth one it. Change one life, it's worth it. I got one last question. To young officers out there starting out, what is the best advice in you over three decades of service? What? What is the best piece of advice you can give them starting out to equip them to have two to three decades themselves? I think they need to identify somebody who's positive, somebody who's a tenured officer and mimic them. Ask away. Ask just like quarterbacks, young quarterbacks coming in the NFL, they talk to the Tom Brady's of the world. That's what we need to do as younger officers. You need to talk to the Tom Brady's of the police department and see how, hey, how to do things, how to survive, you know, survive 30 years in a police department, how to treat people, you know, and and so so if you can really, really, really get in tune with officers who you know got their stuff together, you're going to succeed. That's a perfect way to wrap it up. Major Quig, thank you for your service. Thank you for your friendship, for one. You and I, we, you and I go way back. I, back in the streets. Back in the streets. Oh, man. I love what you're doing. I love your message. And ATO listeners, you got badge 6823, Leroy Quigg sitting here. He's been bridging divides since the 90s. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Hey, brother, hey, sister, I'll never give up on you. Mrs. A. Mister, I'll see this all the way through. No matter how far the sun and the moon, I'll never give up on you. Down when you're lonely, I'll pull you up. Life leaves you heavy when the going gets tough I'll be your shoulder, together we'll run Up from the bottom, yeah, we'll rise above Hey brother, hey sister, I'll never give up on you Hey missus, hey missus I'll see this all the way through No matter how far the sun and the moon I'll never give up on you
sister, I'll never give up on you. Hey, Mrs. Hey, Mister, I'll see this all the way through. No matter how far for the gold and the blue, I'll never give up on you.